John Soane's Museum in Lincoln's Inn Fields is a magical place. Filled with magnificent spaces and intricate architectural details, it's home to an extraordinary collection of paintings, sculptures and artefacts from all over the world. John Soane was one of England's most visionary architects, responsible for many of London's most prominent Regency-era buildings. Before he died, Soane left the house to the nation and stipulated that it must be kept exactly as it was at the time of his death in 1837. But subsequent curators did make substantial changes. Whole areas of the house were remodelled. Works of art and artefacts moved or disposed of. And Soane's private apartments were turned into offices. In 1984, the museum director Peter Thornton decided that the museum must be restored to its original state. And then, in 2008, the new museum director had an epiphany while sitting in his office, which, in Soane's time, had been one of the most splendid spaces in the museum. When I first became director of Sir John Soane's Museum, this was my office, and it looked nothing like this. It was quite an eccentric office, very handsome office, but all these wonderful models and stands and many of the pictures, the stained glass and so on, were either in other locations elsewhere in the museum or in store. And sitting in this wonderful room, thinking about what we needed to do to the museum and looking at that wonderful engraving from the description of the house and collection of Sir John Soane, one realised that actually this, where I was sitting, it was possible to put back all the models, all the stands, all the mirrors, all the paintings, recreate the wallpaper, and actually put this room back to how it was on, in, on Soane's death in January 1837. And I think really, more than any other place in the museum, this was the place where we realised that actually you could also put back his bedroom, his bathroom, his dressing room, and indeed a mirror of other spaces throughout the Soane Museum could be returned to their former splendour. Opening up the Soane was the culmination of 30 years of authentic restoration at Sir John Soane's Museum. At the core of the project was the restoration of lost interiors that had disappeared, most of them in the late 19th century, and had not been seen by the public for well over a hundred years. To put back the glorious interiors in the only surviving house museum from Regency times, the work of a great genius, um, back as they were when Soane died, as his Act of Parliament required. Opening up the Soane was a massive undertaking costing seven and a half million pounds and presenting a huge scholarly and practical challenge. This series tells the story of that restoration. Filmed over a period of six years, it traces the research, the discoveries and the skills that made the transformation possible. The result of opening up the zone is just absolutely amazing. Uh, the project has won awards, but for me it's not really about that. It's about um, putting this glorious place back as Soane left it. I felt always that we had um, a duty to the memory of Sir John Soane um, and to his genius to make sure that his one supreme legacy, this museum, was left as he intended and not left in some sort of 
um, degraded, compromised state, which was really how it was when I, when I joined the staff 30 years ago. The key to the project was the museum's extraordinary archive, a treasure trove of contemporary documents, drawings, notes, letters and pictures, containing a huge amount of detailed information about the museum, from John Soane's time right through to the present day. Helen Dory has spent 30 years exploring this archive and has developed a unique knowledge of every aspect of the museum. It's the key source for restoring the museum to its original state. Because Sue, we couldn't really have done opening up the Sone without you as Sone archivist for almost 30 years and without this incredible legacy of papers in this room left by Sir John Sone. Together with Sue Palmer, the Sone's archivist, Helen has used the archive to ensure that the museum we see today is exactly as it was when Sir John Soane died. And as soon as you look at it, really, you know it's something exciting. Lincoln's Inn Fields, number 13, memorandum relating there to 1812. Yes. Wonderful references. Laid the plates on the walls of the front room, hall floor. And then it goes on up the structure. Some delightful little drawings as well. Fortunately, John Soane was meticulous in recording every detail of his house. So, for instance, we know what kind of carpet he ordered, and even what it cost. A drab and scarlet Brussels carpet, bordered, made up for the bedchamber and dressing room and landing. Quite expensive, £13, two, and two shillings and sixpence. Yes, with a separate charge for laying it down. Um, oh yes, how much do they charge for that? Well... 15 shillings and sixpence. Well, it's a bit confusing because they're also taking down... Oh, the taking bedstead, down the bed. bedstead furniture. These records, um, which are so detailed and of which there are so many, really illustrate why it was so um, critical that we'd spent um, more than 20 years researching the history of the Soane Museum before we embarked on op the opening up the Soane project. Soane owned three houses here. When he died, his collections were in number 13, the middle house with the Portland stone facade. Number 12 on the left was rented out and didn't contain any of his collections. So the first phase of opening up the CERN concentrated on making changes to this house to prepare for the full restoration of number 13. New conservation studios enabled much specialist conservation work to be carried out in-house. A new gallery designed to house temporary exhibitions was installed. A shop was introduced with a range of merchandise. In the first new building for a hundred years, a passageway was created to connect numbers 12 and 13. And an ingenious design enabled a lift to be installed without compromising the traditional atmosphere of the house. The lift was squeezed into an old shaft that had been created from a stack of closets. With these works at number 12 completed, attention turned to restoring the iconic interiors of number 13. One of the most challenging projects was the restoration of two of Sir John Soane's most intricate spaces. They are two little recesses that lie just off the staircase of number 13 the Tivoli recess and, on the floor below it, a shrine to England's most famous dramatist. The Shakespeare recess is a very, very complex little space. Uh, Sir John Soane took essentially two broom cupboards, closets, and turned them into not just this recess but the one above in 1829. Um, and the Shakespeare recess was at that time um, a china closet so uh, when he did this work, he kept that idea uh, by putting a big cupboard at the back of the closet and then building a tribute to Shakespeare around it. He put into it an elaborate stained glass window 
containing uh, scenes from uh, New Testament parables, like the prodigal son, um, and scenes of Christ's life, including the Last Supper. And it's just tucked around in the east wall of the recess, hardly visible from the staircase, but a delight to those who leant over the iron gate and peered into this tiny little space. But several decades after Soane died, the curator James Wilde decided to make massive changes to Soane's recess. He dismantled the china cupboard, took away the bust of Shakespeare, knocked a huge window hole in the north wall of this recess. Shakespeare then sat on the floor, looking rather uh, sad, I think. So it lost all sense of, of anything like a shrine, which was how Soane intended it to appear. The recesses are in a narrow brick extension at the rear of the museum. James Wilde's alterations included taking two feet off the back of the extension. So what Wilde did was he removed two or three foot off the back of the north elevation of the building and completely changed those interiors. So the, the Tivoli recess and the Shakespeare recess were completely altered in their character, which was quite a dramatic alteration to the sewn interiors, a bit of vandalism, you might say. Adding back the two feet of brickwork in order to restore the extension to its original depth would require a bold piece of structural engineering. The rear of the museum is a sea of skylights, and one of them sits directly beneath the brick extension and lights an anteroom that Wilde put in and which is now Grade 1 listed. Simply rebuilding the extension and the recesses to their original depth would clash with the anteroom skylight. The solution was to insert cantilevered steel beams on which the new brickwork would rest and be clear of the skylight. Not an easy task in a 200-year-old building, but the result works beautifully. So this is the two-foot brickwork extension, which projects two foot from the, the face of the north elevation of number 12, which is supported by the metal cantilevered structure projecting uh, northwards. And it's over the uh, Wild anteroom. So you can see the skylight of Wild's anteroom, which was created in the late 19th century beneath it. And you can see how it's been built out with this sort of steel, daring steel structure with a heavy brickwork ab above it. Um, which creates this structural gymnastics. We were quite concerned about structural movement in the, uh, with this. You tend on old buildings not to use steel if you can help it. Steel's very hard and rigid and doesn't move, so if there's any movement, it tends to be sort of a major cracking or catastrophic um, sort of problems which occur, so it's, it's, it was worrying. With the recesses restored to their original size, work could now start on putting back all the elements that Wilde had removed. The stained glass from Soane's original window survived in store with the exception of uh, five pieces uh, which we decided we would attempt to recreate. To understand how these five missing pieces should look, Helen initially turned to the watercolours painted during Soane's lifetime. One very useful indication in this view is the layout of the stained glass, and that agrees with what's shown in the inventory record drawing that was made just before Soane's death, so that's very useful indeed. That inventory is possibly the most important book in the archive. This is one of several copies of the inventory of the contents of Soane's museum that was drawn up at around the time of his death. This is really the holy grail for anyone investigating the history of the arrangement of Soane's collections, which is what I have been investigating for almost 30 years. Um, from it, you can trace the patterns of the hanging of objects in every interior in Soane's house. Um, it contains wonderful diagrams of the stained glass. It was these detailed drawings that enabled the Soane to commission the restoration of the window. 
They turned to a specialist stained glass conservation company in Hertfordshire, Chapel Studio. By 2012, Chapel had almost finished the restoration and would soon return the window to the Soane Museum. Recreating the missing panels had been a complex journey. It started with the Soane researching and providing Chapel with sketches of the appropriate style and approach on which to base the new panels of the two missing saints. Because we had the two original panels of St Paul and St Andreas to work from, we needed to replicate the style that the artist had originally used um, when painting those. So first of all we needed to match the pigment to the original pigments used, which involved a lot of testing. Um, I sort of raided the cupboards and chapel and some of the really old pigments that were surviving here, just to get the right tone as close as I could. Chapel have a rare and extensive collection of pigments, all of them slightly different colours, some of which date back over 50 years. Rachel will have to test many of them on sample pieces of glass before she finds an exact match. Once the correct pigment is identified, Rachel mixes the first of three separate layers, or mats, that will be applied to the glass. I'm going to give it a really slight chop and grind on the palette to make sure all the bumps and lumps are smoothed out. For this first mat, Rachel will mix the pigment with a solution of vinegar and water. So I'm just going to drop a little bit of that in. We want a really nice smooth consistency. So when we apply it to our glass, we're able to achieve a really nice, soft, smooth, matte finish. OK, I'm just loading my brush, making sure that it's got a nice, even amount of pigment in there ready to apply on here. We want to have um, an even layer of pigment over the whole glass as smooth as possible. This is my badger brush. So I'm now just going to work that pigment so it's even all the way across and there's no tied lines. So when you come to work it later, picking it out, you've got a nice uniform finish to work from. Then we leave it to dry. Once this first vinegar mat is dry, Rachel places it over the master sketch of St Matthias, which she will use as a template. She can now start etching away some of the vinegar mat to begin the process of creating the image of the saint. Once that stage is complete, Rachel will add a second mat, this one water-based, so that it won't affect the first vinegar-based layer. Once that's dry, she can continue the etching. And then comes a third, oil-based mat, which will highlight the darker areas. And finally, the completed piece is fired. and emerges as a faithful recreation of the original. So that was quite challenging to work exactly as the artist had worked all those years ago and make it look convincing. And there were repairs to be done as well. The top left-hand panel is 
depicting the scene of the Annunciation and has sustained some damage in the past and has its original leads there, repair leads. We weren't able to remove those repair leads because they were recorded in Soane's time. It has to be left um, in situ. So um, there was one small area in the corner which we were able to remove a lead because that wasn't on the recorded drawing in the journal. So it was decided that that one we could remove from situ and do a very simple resin bond on that. The raising of Lazarus had areas of missing enamel work which were quite um, glaring to the eye um, all along the bottom section of the panel and because it's silver stained on the reverse side to get the, the really beautiful greens of the enamel um, where the enamel was lost you had sort of glaring holes of bright yellow so what we did on a backing plate is we reinforced um, the the blue enamel so when it was plated it just gave a really nice wash of the missing green tone so when they were sandwiched together as you can see there's no detracting areas on that panel. The Last Supper had a crack straight across the front of that panel with a quite a large repair lead. We were able to remove that and resin bond the piece back together so that now reads beautifully. This is the panel depicting St Clair which has been reproduced from the watercolour sketch. We incorporated a ruby border which sits either side of, of the painting. I'm just finishing this panel. Um, I've just applied a very light hand putty under the lead canes and taking off the excess and giving it a really gentle buff up with a very soft brush. This is the last panel of St. Clair, which will be fitted into the lower section of the top sash window here and the remaining openings will be filled with a clear glass as per the sketch in the journal and we're using a P1 restoration glass which mimics a really nice soft distortion that um, you would see in old glass. It's difficult to put a time on how long the project has actually taken from, from the start um, but I would say maybe a good six to seven months to complete the conservation and the reproduction of the missing panels. Directly above the Shakespeare recess, sits another of Soane's exquisite small spaces, the Tivoli Recess. By the time of his death, this recess was a showcase for contemporary sculpture, with works by celebrated artists such as Francis Chartry and Thomas Banks. Soane designed an elaborate ceiling for the recess, with the head of Apollo at the centre of a sunburst. And eagles and snakes featured in each of the corners. But the highlight is a fine painted glass window commissioned by Soane. Depicting the figure of charity, it's based on a painting by Sir Joshua Reynolds. The original glass painting was done by William Collins, a leading 19th century glass painter. However, none of what you see today was present when I joined the museum 30 years ago. After Soane's death, the Tivoli recess, like the Shakespeare recess, was butchered by James Wilde, its depth reduced by about three feet, um, its ceiling was altered, the charity window was taken out at that time because there was no longer room for it in the east wall. A new window was made for it in the north wall of the Shakespeare recess and it was transferred there. 
The Tivoli recess limped on in a much diminished form until 1918, when it was transformed into the curator's new loo. Um, this was part of what was um, called, rather amusingly, the Great Sanitary Crusade, and the new lavatory remained the curator's private loo until um, the opening up the Sewn project. Peter Thornton, our former director, used to say it was his only perk. When I'd completed the research for the opening up the Sewn project, um, it made me realise more than, more than anything, anything else in my 30 years at the museum how much had been lost by James Wilde's ill-advised, in my opinion, um, alterations to Soane's building. What a glorious legacy Soane left and how amazing it is that he stipulated so carefully that it should all be kept as it was at the time of his death. And I found myself thinking of James Wilde, well, how dare he interfere? And how dare he rework um, the, the production of a genius like Soane? And how dare he compromise the appearance of the only Regency Townhouse Museum to, to survive anywhere? Um, and that made me so determined that we, we really must stick to our policy of returning the museum to its appearance at the time of Soane's death, as he wished, and that we had to honour his memory in that way. But World War II had made honouring Soane's memory much more difficult. On the night of October 15th to 16th, 1940, a landmine exploded near the museum. and the magnificent charity window was almost completely destroyed. To recreate the window, the Soane turned to Bali Studio, a leading stained glass studio near York. Here, a skilled workforce practiced a craft which dates from the 13th century. Managing director Keith Barley would take the lead on creating the metal frame and glass panels for the new window. And he approached the leading glass painter, Jonathan Cook, to replicate the image of the figure of charity. And I remember you ringing me and saying, would I be interested? And of course, uh, of course I'd be interested. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, to paint in this style would be a real challenge. And, uh, but they had no specific measurements or detailed designs to work from. So they had to uncover a series of clues to lead them to the right size, shape and design for the window. The first clue was the one small surviving fragment. But first it needed to be linked to other contemporary images of the window. Unfortunately we had uh, this engraving here which showed it in position and we and also had the that. curator's very good records actually Absolutely. I mean Amazing. I mean we I know we keep records today but this was a, a fantastic yeah. find this small surviving piece of the window is clearly visible in the original watercolor of the Tivoli recess as a decorative panel underneath the main painting of charity it could also be compared to the detailed drawing of the window dating from 1837 you know, we, we do yes. have this photograph here when it was moved to the Shakespeare recess. Sifting so carefully we, through uh, other papers and photographs from the Soane archive, Keith Barley was able the, to calculate the, the dimensions image. of the window and to create a full-size drawing of it. But they were still in the dark about the precise shape of the lead framing itself. And then an extraordinary stroke of luck was to fill the gap. And but then you <coughs> sent me this email and you could sense the excitement oh, in the email. That it was, I've been sent this picture from Yeah, I mean, it, was, it was absolutely amazing. You know, we, you know, Out of the our, blue, Keith received an email from a colleague in Germany about a stained glass window that needed restoring and identifying in a house in Hamburg. And there was this sort of worldwide appeal. Does anybody know what this might have been or was? Or and you, you took one look and said, I know exactly, exactly what it is. Yeah. 
Keith immediately recognised it as another charity window, also painted by William Collins. The Hamburg window is now in the Bali studio, in mid-restoration. So, I mean, this was it provided invaluable clues about the exact shape and design of the lead frame. These were the members that we were looking at, and these are the ones that we recreated yes. the the, yes. the actual and sewn frame from. So that that visible face there, and this T yes. uh, formation is is what we've actually yes. used. And a very important piece of yes. information that came came along just at the right time for both of us. With all the clues now uncovered, Bali Studio could complete the construction of the frame. Now it was over to Jonathan Cook to create the glass painting that would sit in the frame. Well, this is a full-size drawing of what the window should look like when it's finished. Um, this one's been done in pencil and you can see the grid for the frame um, when it's finished. This has been quite an interesting drawing to do um, because it's been the original one was based on um, a painting by Reynolds which we can see here and what Collins has had to do to get it to fit within that frame is basically move the figure around so if we were to put that drawing or a frame over the top of that, it would actually go right through Charity's face. And so what the artist Collins has done, he's moved the top of the figure over to the right and repositioned it. So it's not quite where it should be, but it looks right. And the drawing had taken about a year to produce. Um, not solid year, just on and off coming and sitting, looking at it, moving things around as you do with paintings and then doing a little bit more and slowly building it up until we have the finished one. And you have to remember this is not a finished work in its own right, it's actually part of the process, it's a working drawing. So bits of it are not finished and at the bottom we can see there are only little bits of that that just give us an idea of where to go with it. So we don't do the entire drawing, we only put enough information on that drawing so that we can paint the glass to that. So things like the, the um, scroll, this side, we don't do it on this side, we just make a copy of it, reverse it. When you're working with this drawing, what you would do is put your glass over the top, just initially to pick out key points, like eyes, nose, and the general shape of the whole thing. And then you take the glass off and you put the drawing at the side and you work free so that your drawing is an aid. And so it's a bit like life drawing, really. So it can be quite a slow way of painting, but very, very satisfying. sable hair, a bit like combing hair really. It softens it and gives you that very fine texture. It looks more like real hair. And that's the nightmare. A little hair and you literally have to drag it out of the paint because if you leave it because the oil dries so slowly you get little halos appearing around the paint but of course this is a nightmare that glass painters have always had to deal with <laughs> it's the nature of the beast the sewn project has been very interesting because we've not really painted glass in this way for nearly 200 years um, it's more like porcelain painting, but um, because we've not worked in this way for so long, we've actually had to spend quite a bit of time trying to find a way of painting in the same way that Collins worked originally. Um, and that's involved doing a, quite a lot of research, reading books, manuals from the late Georgian period, 
from that we were able to find out some of the oil, water, mediums that they use for mixing the paint because the paint itself is just a powder and so we have to mix the powder with different mediums, with water, vinegar, oil, what have you, and you see from my shelf full of pots of paint, they come in different colours but not that many colours, we really just have black and brown to work with and variations of black and brown. Mixing the paint up is the crucial bit. Now traditional glass painting involved using the paint you mixed with, certainly in the medieval period, with urine or wine or something like that. Um, by the 19th century they were using all sorts of things to mix the paint with, but in the late Georgian period they were using oils in a very peculiar, particular way. And it's that that we have difficulty replicating. So from reading manuals way back, um, we were able to find out the oils that they did use, which were turpentine and an oil that called amber oil. Well, um, amber oil is quite interesting because it's the oil that um, Salvador Dali used exclusively for most of his paintings. And they talk about using it for glass painting, but the modern equivalent doesn't seem to work. So I've had to find different oils to do the same thing. Basically something that is very slow drying. And there in fact is part of the problem because it's, because it's slow drying, it attracts dust as well, which is a bit of a nightmare if you get dust in the paint. Um, it's a bit like the film, it's the agony and the ecstasy because you're discovering ways of working that haven't been used for hundreds of years. But the, the agony is that you're not certain whether you're doing it exactly right. And so you keep playing around with it, moving it forward. It's always sort of one step forward, two steps back. And then you make another two steps forward and one step back. And it's always like that. And just to the point you think you've cracked it, something creeps in to think, mm, no, they didn't quite do it like that. And so you're off again. And you just keep experimenting with different mediums, different brushes. The number of brushes that I've had to experiment with from um, different types of hair have been quite an eye-opener because traditional glass painting, you tend to stick with certain types of hair, certainly for softening the paint. Um, badger hair was the one that you're always taught that would really soften the paint, which are basically decorators' brushes. But for this type of painting, badger hair is too rough, it's too scratchy. And so we've been experimenting and I found an amazing brush that will soften and stipple the paint. And um, policemen will notice what that is. It's actually a fingerprint brush that they use for dusting for fingerprint. But for softening the paint and just gently stippling, it's perfect and it's just squirrel hair. To me, painting, whether it's glass painting or easel painting, watercolour, it's about techniques, about understanding the materials. If you understand the materials, then you can do a lot with it. If you don't understand materials, you're struggling all the time. But then, right at the end of the project, with the completed window ready for installation, there was one more surprise to come. Having made the frame, cut the glass, it all been painted, we're all ready to go. And then, and, and then we, we got this phone call from, from Helen. In 2010, my colleague John Bridges and I were clearing out a filthy cast store in the basement of number 12 Lincoln's Inn Fields. As we got deeper and deeper into the stacks of objects, we suddenly saw, sticking out from behind one of the metal racks, some pieces of metalwork. And when we pulled out the object, I realised one of those heart-stopping moments immediately what we were seeing. Um, a large section of the lower part of the charity window and I, I just couldn't believe it. 70 years after the window was destroyed by bomb blast during World War II, here was a large surviving piece and critically giving us not just more of the beautiful Georgian painted glass but a substantial quantity of the frame giving us all the details of how that was made and how it was coloured and painted. And 
this is, I went down to London and this is what, uh, this is what Helen had discovered. Absolutely remarkable survival a part of the original window, which of course we didn't have at the beginning of the project. I'll just put the light on top in there. And of course this central piece, which we thought was the only original piece, sits yes. here. Absolutely sits there. And of course from a painting point of view, it gives you the original piece, it shows you where the back painting was and what it is. Yes. So it is, you know, it's a... A very important find. A very important a find. find. Indeed. Today, the recreated window, painstakingly made to echo the original in every possible way, sits resplendent in exactly the spot that Sir John Soane wished for it. In the next episode of Opening Up the Soane, we see how this magnificent ceiling was restored. We travel to America, where Soane's wallpaper is recreated. And to the remote Welsh hills to see his bath being made. <laughs>